Let us pray. Gracious God, you've gifted us in so many ways, and we just today just take time to remember the the moments that we got to cherish, spend with our mothers, those brief times that uh, sometimes we say if we could have them back, how special they would be. The women in our lives, the aunts, the mothers, the grandmothers, the, uh, the teachers, ones who spent that extra time with us when we needed those moments of comfort and compassion. And so we thank you, God, for those moments. We lift up all mothers today who are raising their children and ask you to be with them and strengthen them in their hard labor, to comfort them and encourage them and give them the joy that they need to continue their vocation. Pray for expectant mothers and for, uh, for all mothers, for even those who are uh, mothers-to-be. So we honor those this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we are. We're on our last, actually last Sunday in this uh, season of Easter, these, these uh, 50, 50 great days of celebrating the uh, celebrating the resurrection, the cross of, of our Lord. And so uh, we take uh, time just to uh, acknowledge this Easter season and then prepare for what is coming next week, which is the, uh, the new season, the season that the Holy Spirit has been given to us to create the church. So God gave us the Holy Spirit. And so next week is Pentecost, the, the birth of the, of the church, the beginning of the, the Spirit's work in, um, in, this, in this earth and in our lives. And so we uh, prepare our hearts for that next week. We have baptisms still coming along, and adult children baptisms too. A holy First communion classes are underway and uh, next week. The children will be receiving on Pentecost Sunday their First Communion. We have our Ministry of Learning classes, uh, not, to, not today, but starting again next week, and uh, about Christian parenting, about having Jesus involved in our parenting and, and uh, having uh, people who are specialists help us in different aspects of, uh, of Christian parenting. So that continues next week. Uh, Vacation Bible School coming up, so taking uh, signups and application for that, as well as this whole Splash Summer Camp this summer. And so uh, that is still around, and uh, this year's Vacation Bible School is shipwreck. So that's the uh, last week of July. It promises to be great. Church picnic coming up, single service on that day. We'll have a patriotic uh, service that day, children's play, and a picnic to follow. So that'll be a great day coming up, June 3rd. And so our vision always is to help Christians be better Christians. So starting next week, we're changing our, our learning format, our sermon format a little bit, um, and using the Pentecost season to start that. So starting next week, uh, uh, we ask you, we suggest you to bring your Bibles, whether they're uh, on your phone, whether they're on your iPad, whether they're paper Bibles, electronic Bibles, whatever you're using these days. There's also pew Bibles in, in case you um, didn't bring one that day. So, um, and I'm even, I'm even noticed, I put the word please in there. So bring your Bibles, please, starting next week. And so we'll be using our Bibles in a more significant way um, than we have in the past. And so we're changing our format a little bit. You'll see the start of that. And so, uh, and that will carry us right through the whole season of Pentecost, which is the long season of the church. So starting next week. And so uh, we're going to focus on, we've been focusing on how to glorify God during this Easter time, which is what we are called to do in our daily lives and every moment of our lives. Are, we are created to glorify God. And so now we're going to focus on the other aspect of that is really how to please God. Well, how do we please God in our lives? And so that's, uh, that's where we're headed in starting next week, this Pentecost season. And so as always, we remember the words of uh, St. Paul out of Romans 10. So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. Notice hearing is an active sense. It doesn't say... Faith comes once you heard it. You never have to hear it again. 
Faith comes from hearing, and it's a, it's a process of hearing, and our faith is built through hearing, and the hearing by the Word of God. So today, we're starting our new format. We're starting actually with some questions. Today's questions are, and these won't make, may not make sense at the moment, but they will in a few minutes. What year did Abe Lincoln accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior? Ever think about that? And can you name two paintings that are in the Capitol Rotunda? And that'll make sense to you in a moment, too. And what does Romans 8.32 mean to us? Why is that so significant? So we'll take a few moments, we'll take a look at that. I'm a perfectionist, and so that's hard with kids. There's definitely days when I have my doubts about my abilities. I struggle with my temper. I struggle with like how I react with situations. I wish I knew how to, I guess, just calm myself before speaking to them. I wish I was better at taking time to sit down and just listen more to my child. I wish I was more confident in being a mom. I'm not the most patient person in the world. Patience. Patience is far and away probably the biggest struggle. I just want them to know just how much I love them. is totally awesome. He's fun to snuggle with. Pretty funny. She does cook a lot of food for me. She's just unique. That's why I love her so much. We go on dates together. Like, we go shopping. She loves me a lot. I have a lot of favorite things about my mom. We like to watch movies together and color and stuff. We go to church together, we volunteer together. She is like my heart, I guess you could say, because she's that close to me. My favorite thing is to jump on a trampoline with my mom. That's my most favorite thing to go up high. We like get ice cream or something and like you go to the nail salon and have fun. <laughs> my mommy's my hero. She's pretty and beautiful. She is my hero. She just will care about me and just always love me forever. She's the best. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> I always seem to focus mostly on the negative, and I guess I can walk out of here and say that I'm doing something great and that my child is viewing me in totally different lenses as I view myself. So that's, that's inspiring. This is my calling. This is my job. This is what I love to do and I will do it better and with love each and every day because those kids count on me and they love me for what I'm doing. So be encouraged, moms, you are loved. You are loved. So Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my mother. It's interesting that he said this because his mother died when he was nine years old, and then his father remarried, and he had a stepmother. And he loved both his mother and his stepmother. His stepmother loved him really well. And so we don't really know when he wrote that, whether he was talking about his natural mom or his stepmom. And maybe we don't need to know, and maybe that's the way he wrote it. But for our president, Abe Lincoln, that was an important part of his life, was his mother. And I should say mothers, both of them, his mother and his stepmother. So uh, what's interesting, when we think of Abe Lincoln and, and probably thinking back in history, you may have these images of uh, 
Abe Lincoln sitting by the, they didn't have any electricity, so he's sitting by the fireplace in his house and didn't have a library and a lot of books. He grew up in a log cabin, very poor. And so what they did have in the house was a Bible. And so you can almost imagine these images of Abe Lincoln reading the Bible in his house and being raised uh, in a Christian family and all those kinds of things. It grows up to be a great president. Well, some of that was true and some of that needs to be added to because it's even more significant than that. When Abe Lincoln was 53 years old, his son Willie died. Willie was 11 years old. And so this sent his wife off the, off the deep end. She, she lost it. And she started going to mediums. She started going to palm readers, crystal balls, all this kind of thing, asking, looking for hope and everything. And I don't know whether she had any faith or she lost her faith, but she went through this great spiritual crisis. The same thing happened for Abe Lincoln. Not only did he lose his son, but he was in the midst of the Civil War, the beginning of the Civil War. And so in the rotunda, which I'm going to show you a minute, the capital of the uh, White House, which was actually there in, a, in the time of Abe Lincoln, in the center, and this is the, actually the center I'm showing you, is the uh, <clears throat> burial of Billy Graham, who was 99 years old when he died. And you can see there's a lot of people here, um, and it was a, a good size showing for Billy Graham. But around the outside of the rotunda, there are eight paintings, eight paintings, and they're, and they're older, very old paintings, and they depict different parts of our, uh, of our history there. And um, I'm going to show you two of the paintings in a minute that are, I think are really significant. One of them is the embarkation of the pilgrims. And these paintings are, are uh, 12 by 18 feet. These are huge paintings, 12 by 18 feet. So one of them that has been there since the 1800s is the pilgrims praying in England. You can see them praying here, reading their Bibles, getting ready for this trip to America. It's such a great, wonderful painting. It's worth going to the Capitol and Rotunda just to see this painting, right? And so you can, just, you can just pour into and sense the spirituality and what was going on as they prepared to leave England in this boat, 102 pilgrims, separatists, who were coming over to glorify God and populate this new country. And the other painting, which is really significant as well, is after the pilgrims got here, what did they do? One of the first things they did and this is the baptism of po Pocahontas. And you might say to yourself, hey, I thought Pocahontas was in a Disney movie. No, she's a real person. And so the baptism of Pocahontas is one of the paintings that is on the, on the wall of the rotunda in the Capitol building, in our nation's capital. And right behind her is her husband-to-be who's going to wed her after she gets baptized. So this is one of the very first baptisms of the, of, that the pilgrims um, conducted into the new world. So the baptism of Pocahontas. So you, have the, so you have the paintings on the wall. One of them is the embarkation of the pilgrims. The other one is after the pilgrims are here, the baptism of Pocahontas. So now you're wedding the, the, uh, the tribe that she belonged to and the, and the Indian chiefs to the pilgrims. So we have this, this cross-cultural marriage that is one of the first ones, right? And so it's a great, great art. And so those paintings are hanging on the wall in the, uh, in the Capitol building. Well, back to the rotunda, the time of Abe Lincoln, not only did he lose when he's 53 years old, his 11-year-old son, Willie, his wife completely melts down. He has a crisis in his own faith because this rotunda, it wasn't filled with congressmen. It was filled with 2,000 wounded soldiers. Union soldiers that were filled. And so, and so Abe Lincoln, they're losing the war at this time. And the, the Capitol building where he works in the, in the White House is filled with wounded 2,000 soldiers. If you can imagine 2,000 soldiers on cots here, there's not even 2,000 people here. Wall-to-wall -wall soldiers, wounded soldiers, bleeding and dying here. So Abe Lincoln is having his faith crisis, not only with his own family, but with his career as being a president. So what does he do? He goes and he starts to visit a minister, he starts to visit a pastor because he realizes that he needs Jesus, he needs God in his life. So he turns his life, at 53 years old, he turns his life over to Jesus, which is an amazing event because he only lived for three more years. And out of that turning his life over to Jesus came the courage to then 
put together the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, because our Constitution before that supported slavery. So now he puts together the 13th, 13th Amendment, which has abolished slavery, sets out, delivers the Gettysburg Address, and also leads our nation together to keep it as one nation at the same time to condemn slavery once and for all. So a great, great thing. But these came within the three years after he spent time every day with his pastor in Washington, D.C. at a Presbyterian church, gave his heart to Jesus, started reading the Bible, and turned his heart over to Jesus when he was 53 years old. He died at 56. So a great, great event in a great place. So he did owe everything to his mother, except he owes his heart, and we owe our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ for steering him through the, one of the greatest crises our nations ever faced. So we think of Jesus today in the scripture that Jolene read. Jesus could have easily said to one of his disciples, hey, by the way, if anything happens to me, such as crucifixion, anything like that, would somebody take care of my mom? Could have said that easily. But Jesus uses the framework, the drama, of hanging on the cross, of hanging on the cross this time where he knew that he would be hanging on a cross and his mother would be there, the time that he could send to the world to tell his disciple, behold, this is your mother, and to his mother, behold, this is your son. One of the greatest images we can ever think about. Behold your mother. Behold your son. Always dying on the cross a few minutes before his death, proclaiming to the world to see that it was never about Jesus. It was always about taking care of other people and how he always was serving us. All parents are broken. One thing that we realize as we grow up but they were chosen by God to bring us into the world. Before the foundation of the world, our parents were chosen to lead us and guide us. So whatever you may think of your parents, they were chosen by Jesus before the foundation of the world to bring us into this world. So finally, Romans 8.32, one of the greatest things Paul has ever written, and he says to us, he, talking about God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. The greatest thing that God the Father loved was his son, who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all. Then how shall he not also freely give us all things? If God was going to give us his son, the greatest thing he ever could give, how could we be worried about lesser things? How can we be worried about aches and pains and paying the rent and will our kids make it to school and what's going to happen here and there? How can you worry about those things? He, gave, he already gave us the greatest thing possibly he could ever give. The lesser things, of course, we're going to get. Of course, he's going to take care of us in the lesser things because he already gave us the greatest thing he could possibly give us, his son. Is anything else harder than that? already gave us the greatest thing. So anything else we ask is, it's frosting on a cake. It's nothing. Anything that we can pray or even think of praying, it's not hard for God. Of course he's going to freely give us all these things because he already gave us the most valuable thing in the universe. The greatest thing he could possibly give us was already given to us. The other thing we're thinking about, no worries. No worries, it's all there. Eternal life is not a gift from God, it is the gift of God. Not just a gift, it's the gift of God. Eternal life, what we have today. What our mothers who have gone on before us have, sitting in the arms of Jesus, the gift of God. So we remember our mothers, we remember Jesus' mother. We remember the fact that Jesus took care of his mother even at the cross. 
God took care of us through giving his son. God himself handed over his son. Nothing greater has ever happened or ever will. Or ever will. There's nothing greater that will ever happen than this. We know it. We know what it is. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever, never changes. That's a promise to us. It will never change for us. So we have no excuse. We have no excuses not to come to him in prayer. No excuses to, to pretend he's not hearing us, that he's not going to do his good will toward us. There's no excuses at all. To come, God, come to God freely because he already gave us his best. So what year did Abe Lincoln accept Jesus as the Savior when he was 53 years old? Two paintings in the Capitol Rotunda that are important. Baptism of Pocahontas and the embarkation of the pilgrims. And what does Romans say? 832, God has already given us the greatest thing. He's already handed over his son, Jesus, to us. The greatest gift. Nothing else will ever be greater. Second Corinthians, we walk by faith and not by sight. Happy Mother's Day. Let us stand. Let us uh, say together as the band comes up. A memory verse out of Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace from our hearts to the Lord. All right.